In today's episode of Dance Med Spotlight, I had the honor to interview Chantelle Pianetta, who is a professional dancer in both the ballet world and West Coast swing world. In the episode, we talk about a whole variety of things, including what it's like to balance two very different styles of dance as a professional, ways that she supports herself through health and wellness, what it's been like working with folks within the wellness and medical communities, and challenges that she's encountered along the way. Welcome back to another episode of Dance Med Spotlight, where we talk about all things dance medicine. Today, I have a fabulous guest on with me. She's been dancing in the professional ballet world for the last 13 years and is currently lighting up the stage with Golden State Ballet. Besides that, she is also a champion in the West Coast swing dance scene uh, and was just inducted into the California Swing Dance Hall of Fame. Help me welcome Chantel Pianetta. <laughs> welcome, Chantel. Hi, Alyssa. Good to be here. So, Chantel, tell me a bit about what it is that you do as a professional dancer. Let's just start there. Mm -hmm. Um, so I have kind of a, a dual life because I am a professional in two different fields. So I have two different modes that I go into and work for and toward. Um, one is my uh, professional ballet career, currently with Golden State, as you said. Um, so that, when I'm on season, which I currently am, um, uh, happens... Uh, starts at 9.30 a.m. We have company class and then we have rehearsal from about 11 to 3 p.m. Monday through Friday, working on different ballets. Um, and then we perform uh, at the moment twice a year um, down in the Southern California area in San Diego. Um, and then on the back side, um, when that's not going on or when I have free weekends, I travel around the world with my dance partner and partner in life, uh, Joel Torgerson, teaching West Coast Swing. And that involves teaching swing, it involves judging contests, it involves um, putting a routine on the floor, a choreographed piece of swing that we're working on on our um, during our spare time and and then also having a lot of improvised competitions and doing that um, around the swing circuit. I know a lot of the audience listening is probably quite familiar with the ballet side of things. Tell me more about what West Coast Swing is so they don't just hear it from me. <laughs> Yeah, West Coast Swing is um, a modern version of swing dance. So often when people hear the word swing dance, they think of like Lindy Hop, the 40s, the big band era. Um, West Coast Swing came from that. It, its roots started um, in that. Uh, and then it evolved um, through the 1960s, 70s until today. What separates it from the older swing dances is that it changes with the times, it changes with the music. It is still partner dance and it involves like six and eight beat patterns and uh, two beat extensions and all, all that. Um, but West Coast Swing is almost like a, a modern dance fusion of partnering, connection, um, it's often, often improvised. I mean, we do have routines, like I said, but, but it, the joy in it for most of us is like coming together with, with a person hearing a random song and then creating, and it doesn't necessarily have to be in one particular style of dance almost. You can pull from, um, whatever, you know, in a way. And as long as you have that intrinsic understanding of the swing, um, stretch and compression with your partner, you can kind of, you can just invent a world of things mainly based on the music and the feel and that negotiation between you and your partner. So it has a lot more freedom, um, 
especially for the follow side, usually like when leaders lead dances, they, they have an idea and the follow executes, but in swing it, it becomes more of a conversation than any other partner dance that I've experienced. And this is why I love it so much compared to some of the others I've dabbled in. Um, so it, it's a, like a wonderful equal opportunity for people to, to meet in the middle through the language of dance and then explore something new and then let it go and then develop something with someone else. It's, it's endlessly fun. Um, so it's hard to, to package in a way to <laughs> tell other people like ballet, you can see ballet and um, see the form and it has such a, a long history, hundreds of years. Um, so West Coast Swing is, uh, you know, going on maybe like uh, 50 or 70 years, maybe. Um, so we're still very young in our dance form, but I think it's yeah. been just growing and especially on social media as of late, more people are starting to learn about it, but I want to encourage um, it to be discovered because I think a lot of, it will speak to a lot of people or it could because of its variety of style. Yes, definitely. And that's, I think you hit on a couple of things that really speak to me as somebody who also does West Coast Swing. I love the improvised nature of it. The fact that you can have these moments that you create with that partner to that music at that moment in time that will never, ever, ever happen again. So it's this cool, just like unique experience every single time. And being able to pull in other experiences of dance is really cool. Like I know when I first started watching you in videos or at events, I was like, I have a feeling she has a ballet background before I ever knew that you were also a professional in the ballet world just because of some of your movements that you incorporate into it. Um, so that's one of the things that I really love about it. Everyone has their own flavor for it too. Mm -hmm. um, so since we're, since this is the Dance Med podcast, um, one thing I want to ask you about is especially balancing these two different professional sides of dance for yourself and having a very busy schedule with all of that. What sorts of things have you learned for yourself along the way to help keep you healthy and sane and all of those things um, with all of that going on? Um, well... First off, like mentally balancing the swing in the ballet gives me personally a bit of a yin and yang. Um, so I don't get bogged down in any one form or, you know, sometimes I'll have a tough day in ballet rehearsal and then I'll kind of get, want to get mentally wrapped up in that and burrow down. And, and then if I have swing later, um, it kind of helps pull me out of that and like give me, shifts my perspective for a bit almost like going to that that other task, getting myself out of myself, working on something entirely different and then bouncing back and vice versa happens as well. Um, so it is, it, um, it really, I really enjoy both because both are, they're like opposite ends of the dance spectrum, practically. They're, they're actually like really, yeah new ballet dancers in swing, even though it is like a wonderful like compliment to the form, but the way we think and handle movement, it's like, you know, speaking uh, like English for speaking what I imagine like Mandarin or some something like going from like, um, or going from a romance language to a total language, like mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So if one can make that transition, then it becomes really fulfilling, but um, it's, it's, uh, tricky sometimes, but for me, the fun is in the, the bouncing back and forth and that keeps me stimulated. So I don't, um, um, get too hyper-focused or worried about any one thing I just did. Um, and then physically they're also kind of opposite where, um, ballet like really takes a toll on my lower body, my, my lower chain from my hip feet down that um, it is like really intense as most people know um, with that demand where upper body is a little bit lighter it's usually not as much weight bearing it's more of like holding tone and frame um, so we don't get as many injuries like up there um, but swing uh, <laughs> that introduced me to actually a whole different kind of upper body training when I first went in a lot to do with like um, shoulder strength, upper back strength, like when to hold tone, when to release, how to leverage with a partner. 
Mm -hmm. So I've like developed a lot more upper body strength and need for that to balance with swing. Um, of course, swing is um, challenging on the on the feet as well and, and all that. Um, but, you know, since coming from ballet, I have developed those strengths from there. It doesn't affect it as it seems easier to me, but it, but it is demanding. Um, so I kind of have to hit both sides of the body depending on which type of what I'm doing more. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so if, it's, if it's a swing season and I also do showcase um, where we do lifts with a partner and that you know requires a lot more physicality there then I'll have um, different like shoulder PT and um, making sure I'm training that um, whereas with ballet I get a lot of like um, lower like tendonitis so I'll be making sure I'm doing a lot of exercises, more disability work, uh, a lot of eccentric loading, um, um, because that's usually when I get injured. <laughs> so it's doing something at the end of a boom, end of full range and then contracting. Yeah. Um, so it's both have taught me a lot about uh, myself. And then I also keep, I am very diligent uh, now about um, strength training about five days a week um, with weights and and then with some Pilates and yoga influence and I feel like that has really brought me to another level in both forms to help with my longevity and injury prevention as I as I get older um, especially now I'm at my age <laughs> um, 30s uh, I'm kind of an older ballerina um, the, in the past sense, a lot of a lot of times, ballet dancers would only last until maybe early 30s at most, and then things break down. But I think with advances in like dance medicine, sports medicine, like we're lasting longer, and mm -hmm. I think because of this different um, training awareness, body awareness, and attention to health and fitness in this way. So I um, have like a an app with a trainer. Uh, it's called Future, but um, I really I really enjoy it, and it helps give me a, a consistent um, form, something to fall back to. I know I have a million routines in my day, but this routine like helps me kind of wear away all the the dance debris and like help yeah. strength. And um, I really uh, have been using that a lot, especially this past uh, year. I think it's important that we hear from a dancer what strength training and all of that has done for you because I know that has not always been the case as being part of the culture. I know growing up in dance, a lot of times you would hear things like, you know, don't lift weights because it's going to make you bulky. Or uh, another guest that I've had on here was talking about when she was growing up doing ballet, she was excused from all of her PE classes and things like that so that she wouldn't get hurt or wouldn't build up the wrong muscles and all of that kind of thing. So it's it's nice that it's shifting, but then also nice to hear that you have found success in using those exact things that we used to be warned away from. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everyone's physical journey is different with what they can handle and can't handle, what's too much, what's too little, what what um, style of dancer and mover they are. Um, mm -hmm. Like for me, I'm more of a, like a, a power athlete, like, if I like, I don't know, weren't in ballet, I'd be doing some kind of, uh, I'd be like a, a sprinter or like a, <laughs> uh, I don't know, like a, a short distance swimmer or something like that. I got, mm -hmm. I like to feel that that power and that push versus like, I would never, I never want to like run a marathon per se. Like that doesn't call to me. Um, but for some dancers, even ballet dancers, like that's their thing, they run. Um, so we're all kind of, different and um yeah and there is definitely that stereotype um of like of the ballet dancer having the fear of getting bulky especially the female um for you know doing squats or like lifting heavier things and uh <laughs> i want to like put it out there that that uh i don't find that to be true or like i i don't think that's that fear is valid, like, um, and, mm -hmm. and I've used, you know, 
I currently like use a significant amount of weight and do a lot of squats and I only feel better for it. Like if I go into my grand plies or I go, I need like different like one-legged lunges into choreography. <laughs> like sometimes the choreographers will say like, oh, are you okay? Like, oh, you're down there, you know, like, oh, this is gonna be hard. And like, now I can be like, no, this is fine. Like I've been training this, it's good. And I, and I feel like, Yes, I have more muscle tone on my body, but mm -hmm. it's it's tone that that fits my form. It's not this like random bulk um, that I've just grew out of nowhere. It like mm -hmm. fits me. So and embracing that, and I think um, in the culture now, it is shifting towards a more athletic form is more accepted versus like the the gaunt, hollow, almost like model, fragile form of decades mm -hmm. past. It's like, fading a bit and I think uh, a healthier stronger female form is is being represented more in the scene and I mean so we still have places to go in it but it's a it's it's shifting a bit and and I want to help um, support that shift and then I'm with a company now that really supports like my style and size and other dancers like me with who are like look strong and athletic and like putting that on the stage and I think that's um good and, <laughs> and mm -hmm. like uh, a nice shift and so people the audience members can like see the the dancers up there and not have it be so ethereal so alien almost um they can see humans and people um with bodies and of different shapes and doing cool athletic feats or beautiful things and have that be um, appreciated. I think it's it's important now in the yes. century as we're as we're moving forward. Um, yes. So and then swing has been more accepting of that too, and so that's mm -hmm. also why hopefully it's it's nice to have that world because it, there there aren't the ballet standards or ballet standards of beauty ideal whatever in swing. There's a, a lot of shapes and sizes and people of all ages and walks of life too. So it's really refreshing for me to be soaked into that environment um, and uh, feel feel that variety. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> getting um, uh, also though on the flip side with swing, I feel like maybe there could be more of a push for a little bit of more like health and fitness. Like almost the other end of swing used to be a more Kind of especially in in conventions and things it's a little bit more of a not party is a strong word but but kind of like fun where people like dance all night and yeah drink maybe not like and uh, like there isn't an attention to oh we're doing something athletic it's like oh we're having fun this is just all casual um now it's kind of turning into like oh maybe we can't dance till 4 a.m and then and get up and do the workshop and dance effectively in our comp. Maybe we need sleep. Maybe we need to not like social dance for six hours in a row and then try to do everything else the next day or to be like wrecked for the work week. Like, mm -hmm. like learning what pacing is and then learning, you know, about um, also for them about strength training or PT or other things they can do outside of swing. Um, and then <laughs> um, swing is also um, asymmetrical in terms of um, how you connect with your partner. You're not doing everything on both the right and the left, where a ballet is a, a bit more symmetrical. You're, mm -hmm. you're hollow side and you have a lead side. And even if you switch roles, it's not perfectly symmetrical. Um, you would have to yeah. like switch and mirror and do all four things to get the full body. Which right. I don't know if people realize that, but after like many years, like, follows will develop like a certain shoulder that hurts or leads like a certain hip or um is very common so it's really important then not just to do your your swing dance in your role to be able to vary that or vary with other activities outside um so i don't know i again it's like putting both worlds uh, the best and worst of both and trying to um uh, bring them together and learn from each other yeah. Yeah. And I love that. And it's so true where I think 
I'm at least hearing more conversations with West Coast swing dancers about, you know, oh, how do I maybe better prepare for my weekend and pace myself through it? Or, you know, I'm, I am seeing more local clients from the West Coast swing community in the office wanting to build up strength and make their bodies more resilient for what they're doing and, and help their technique and that sort of thing, which is really nice to see because I think, yeah, especially when I first was getting into it and until more recently, it sometimes feels like, you know, oh, this is just my hobby and a fun thing I do and not so much I am still an athlete in what I'm doing and need mm -hmm. to support that. So I'm glad to start seeing some of that shift within our community yeah. there too. Yeah, just like some people have, like running is a hobby or they run here and there, but you don't want to run with poor, if you run with poor form for a long time, if it's your hobby of many years, then you're not going to be able to run for ever. And so trying to introduce that, that good form and good habit to support, even if it's your hobby. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see. I have a couple of questions bouncing around in my brain, but let's go with, um, what has been your experience as a dancer working with folks in the medical community? Because I know there is a wide variety of experiences out there that dancers have had. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, personally have a pretty intuitive sense of what my body is telling me and what I need. And that directs me pretty well on like who I should go to, whether it's like a, an MD, whether it's a chiropractor, whether it's PT. Um, so having that distinction first um, allows me to, has allowed me to kind of, um, put myself where I think I need to be with any given injury or issue. Um, saying that, there are definitely a, <laughs> a variety of, of styles and um, levels of expertise within all those fields. And I haven't had any, well, maybe I've had like, <laughs> well, there's been like one chiropractor that's been actually really terrible that I never went to again, but um, generally uh, no other horror stories of like, mm -hmm. of uh, practitioners just, um, I don't know, saying something that, that doesn't fit or suit or support me. Um, mm -hmm. So um, if anything, like for, if I'm going to like, um, like an MD, then, I usually get like the, like the, oh, you're like healthy, you're, you're fine, like da, da, da. And I'll have to kind of like push to, to ask for certain tests or things and because they're more laissez-faire about it based on my like general like um, lifestyle. It's, it's better than average. So it's fine. If it's not like absolutely broken, then we don't need to deal with it. But I, yeah. I want to... Uh, I'd rather catch things or understand things and know before the bad thing happens. So I have more preventative care. And, and I um, am currently trying to like research um, um, more of that and to figure out um, what I need to know going forward as I'm like going through my decades of life mm -hmm. in order to have like a major event of any kind. Um, so it's like, I'll have to ask for, like, um, like I have history, like, uh, my dad had like a heart attack at 40 and he's fine now, but and fine. But I'm like knowing to ask for my, a cholesterol panel like or that, or my mom has breast cancer knowing when, like, maybe I should get like screening earlier than 50. Like I think now it recently mm -hmm. to drop down to maybe 40, 45. Mm -hmm. so, so having that in the back of my mind or watching my blood pressure, like, like even, even though I'm eat healthy and feel healthy and have a healthy weight, like there's stress, there's sleep, there's all that. So staying on top of that, I feel like a personal responsibility. And so t sometimes I'll have to push a little bit to be like, no, I really, I'd like that test or I'd like to check in or, mm -hmm. or even like, um, uh, I do like a DEXA scan once in a while, um, just to see like body composition, like, 
um, muscle, fat, bone levels, mm -hmm. density, and it's really important. Um, so having that check in, and then, um, and then I'm pretty picky about um, like chiropractors and um, massage professionals. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like it's like I can like when they put their hands on me, I can tell if they are empathic, intuitive, um, or if they're just going through the motions. Um, and then I'll find the people that really resonate. And it's usually it's often people with some kind of dance background or a specialization with dancers that have helped me the most. Um, I have mm -hmm. a really wonderful chiropractor now who is also a West Coast swing dancer. Um, and she has just kept me going, <laughs> especially recently. Um, and yeah, it's just, I don't know, those the relation, it's like developing relationships and building your team. And mm -hmm. that can be hard to find depending on your area. Um, but I'm a big advocate of it. if it doesn't feel right, if it doesn't, if you have to um, if you don't agree with the person or it doesn't quite gel or they're not hearing you, I would say go try someone else or like go keep looking. And maybe who needs to yeah. see that one person because maybe they're the only person available at the moment. But like, I was like date around or shop around. Right. Right. That, that fits and understands. And so you can tell your story of your, your injury or malady and then they can uh, finish your sentence in a way or be on board with you or, or introduce something about the anatomy that you didn't quite know, but, but it, but, oh, that it fits my experience. And like, let me learn more about that. And I love that, um, combination between, um, health professional and a dancer athlete, that, that back and forth of, of like, oh, this, this is going on. Or like, oh, and then knowledge from the professional and then the professional getting a real life experience of like, this is how this is being used and this is when this is breaking or not, or this is how long this lasts. Um, um, so uh, it's, it can be quite interesting because we, we take these as athletes and dancers and like push it to the extremes. Like maybe you wouldn't get a textbook use of a hip flexor or something, but like, no, mine goes all the way here and <laughs> this long. So uh, <laughs> what do you think about this? Um, so it's it's a fun way to kind of, I think it's uh, push the field and like um, figure out new potentials of body and like how to to work at that that higher caliber and and not just have the bar here, but have the bar open depending on, on the person. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of things that you said that I think I want to go back and touch on because I think they were really important. The idea of building your team of people, because it really is more than just one thing that we can use to support our bodies, to support our mental health, whatever it is we're talking about, um, and finding those people, not being afraid of sort of shopping around and finding the right fit and the right combination. It could be, you know, maybe you have one person who, like you said, is pretty specialized and is kind of your one person here. Maybe they don't tick all the boxes, but you can find someone else that complements that and fills in some of the gap for you too from another profession, for example. Mm -hmm. I think also the idea of having someone who understands dance is important because yeah, there's so much where we we push our bodies beyond what is normal mm -hmm. or what our body is maybe built for. And I know, you know, even going through school for physical therapy and now teaching in a PT program, we learn about what are normal ranges of motion or normal whatever. For a ballet dancer, being able to get your hip to a hundred degrees isn't enough because, you know, we want to get the leg way up here somewhere. So mm -hmm. understanding that and being able to, in a healthy and safe way, support the body doing that is really important. Whether the person has dance experience themselves or just has a good understanding of what a dancer needs. Mm -hmm. Have there been any times where, you know, maybe in training and while you were growing up, you sort of had to learn a hard lesson for yourself of maybe dialing back on training, giving yourself more recovery time, like things where it was like, ooh, maybe if I had done 
this other thing or had this other support, I wouldn't have been in this situation or can support myself better in the future if it comes up. Um, yeah, that one, um, for me, that that's more of the, the mental piece of psychology that has taken me a long time to figure out for myself. Whereas the physical, it's like, I'm, I'm pretty okay with, I can, as the body break, I like, I can feel it. And then I have a natural tendency to pull back or rest or this or that. And so that's fine. But, but mentally it's been challenging for me. Um, when I was like a teenager, a young adult, like being in the, the pressurized system, mostly in ballet of like trying to fit a certain mold and like getting all these, um, uh, having having feedback or, or observing how people would watch me or regard me and um, how that affected my own psychology and feelings of like self-worth and, and um, feelings of like what I should do or shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was hard. Um, yeah, I, um, it's as, as I'm someone who like, is almost like too sensitive or too aware of my environment and the people around me. Most like, you know, caring too much what people think or that perfectionist mentality as a teen. I was just like wanted to, to be the thing and to, to, you know, do what was right and what, pe you know, the professionals said I should or what my teachers like wanted. I wanted to be that. But sometimes like I, I'd fall short of that or I couldn't, couldn't handle that. And then I didn't have the tools at the time to to own that and to mm -hmm. be like no this is like how i'm feeling and this is okay and like i you know need maybe a little bit of a break from it or like um or not beating myself up about like not doing something perfectly or or um like um looking a certain way at a certain moment um so that really Mm, got me bogged down and then I had some went into some depression in my late teens had disordered eating for a time as like a reaction to the the emotion the psychology of that environment where you know with with all those types of like addictions and disorders it's it's not about that thing itself it's about the the underlying um emotional state and and um, feelings that aren't being addressed that that you turn to different things. Um, so I went through a period of that. Um, and then that's when I found swing. And like, you know, my therapist suggested like, why don't you try this? And so again, it was that, that putting, bringing myself out of that, that pressurized environment, mentally able to free that up, let things go. And then um, a couple of years later, I was able to dive back into to ballet and become a professional there. And like since then, I've been like learning tools um, about my uh, mental game, like um, the that mental side of sport and like gearing up for, for something and then, um, you know, holding that that emotional space for myself when I'm in a pressurized situation and then being able to deal with that or being able to like separate that from who I am as a person and um, and having having those those tools um, develop, but that's taken me like uh, 20 years to develop. <laughs> so maybe I'm, I'm a little bit remiss that it's taken me that long, but at least I feel more confident now in it and a better approach. So like, maybe for my like, you know, 17 year old self, like I wish I knew that then, I wish I wouldn't have like held on so hard or worried so much and had such a reactive nature. If I would have just like, calmed down a bit and like carried on, like mm -hmm. it would things would have been easier, sure. But then, uh, you know, I got to learn lessons some way. So, yes. so it's taken me this amount of time to have that, but I'm grateful that I've like, figured it out a bit um and that isn't always the case sometimes we re people reach roadblocks and they just switch careers switch things get out of it and so I'm very stubborn I wanted to figure it out <laughs> and um and so it's just yeah having that that 
separation between what you do and who you are is like really important for I think both dancers and athletes and then being putting ourselves in those pressurized situations but finding like peace finding some mental space away and like professionals have helped with that like more on the the therapy side or um mm -hmm. um in terms of that or maybe some MD cert in in that way but um and then having support from like good good friends and family around like your community and that's what also what swing does well too it has that that um it brings you not just like friends, like, oh, fun swing friends, but there is that sense of community. I think that's really like psychologically healthy. Mm -hmm. And because we do have competitions all the time, and that is very stressful. And like we're literally compared number to number to people. Right? Where in ballet we're not we're not given numbers, like we don't we don't know. But in swing it's like, no, you were like this much better than that person um this weekend and then this weekend like it flipped or like you mm -hmm. there's jockeying and it's it's real and um <laughs> presented in front of you as such there's nowhere to hide and it's just like you have to accept it and then move on and like Definitely. the does we get a lot of practice in that of like okay I was you know seventh like this weekend last weekend I was first I gotta like take it in, swallow it, you know, you know, move on. Um, those things mm -hmm. happen you have to like hold to the top so much. And then the community is very supportive since everyone's kind of, most people are kind of going through that competitive journey somewhat to different degrees. Everyone has this understanding of like, oh, we've been there, done that. Like, you know, you're still you, I'm still me. Like, let's just keep dancing. And so that's been like wonderful to be a part of. Mm -hmm. um, other forms too. Yeah, I love that. And it's so true. I mean, I know when I first started getting into competition and swing, there was always this, you know, I, I kept lists of myself of how many competitors there were in my division and what place I got, like what percentage was I at, compare it to another time. And like, I went crazy with it. And then I finally got to a point where it's like, you know, yes, I want to do well, but for me, it's not how I place. It's just, I want to put on a good performance and feel like I did my personal best in those dances. Mm -hmm. And so once I kind of figured that out, that I didn't need to push for my placement, but just be happy with what I'm doing, that made such a difference in how I felt going into weekends and into competitions. It helped just, you know, with my overall viewpoint on things, finding what my drive was and how to support that and not feel like I had to fight for something that it seems like everyone else is fighting for or that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And actually this will, this will lead us nicely into a segment on the show. <laughs> So the final bow is the opportunity for you as the guest to share sort of your final takeaway message, what you hope the listeners or audience walk away with from our conversation today. Yeah. To like, no matter like what you're, what you do or who you are, whether you're like a hobbyist or a professional athlete, just to keep doing what you want to do um to the highest degree but don't own what you can control and what you can't control um in that support yourself with those those tools that you need um and work hard but then the rest has to fall where it falls and you can't necessarily guarantee a result or or an ability to come along you have to be in love with the journey of it and not necessarily the destination. Destinations mm -hmm. will happen, but just, you know, I know it's a little bit trite, but, you know, enjoy the journey um, <laughs> as such. But but really, um, that that is what I found to be um, more, more comforting, more allowed me to be more just like steadfast and at peace with my myself and my choices in life with what I'm doing and allowed me to mm -hmm. have longevity that I've 
wanted by not being so concerned about where it's going. Um, mm -hmm. And then just supporting myself day to day with what do I need now? What, you know, maybe what do I need tomorrow? But well, setting the dominoes up and not necessarily just wanting to see the picture at the end and knock them down. Just, um, yeah, just to have that patience with yourself. Yeah, I love that. This final piece is an opportunity for you to promote anything that you have going on or that you're doing. So if there's any shameless plug that you want to share, this is your chance. Uh, well, like if uh, everyone wants to find me, they can find me on uh, social medias, on Instagram, Facebook. Um, I'm available for private coaching. I still have that going on. It's come over from the pandemic, but it's a wonderful way to keep in contact with all of my students around the world. I do have a periodic um, uh, fitness channel called Corecast that, that I pop into every now and again when I'm off ballet season and I like um, to uh, reconnect with people who want to move and learn a little bit more about um, the, the maintenance, the Pilates, the strength training, um, to move with me and to, you know, try on some of the things I do day to day. So that's Corecast. You can find that on my Facebook. Um, yeah, and then if you want to follow me and my dance partner, Joel, Chantel and Joel on TikTok and Instagram. And then if you're in the Southern California area, especially during Nutcracker, I'll be dancing with Golden State Ballet. It's a really fun show. Great. Well, thank you, Chantel, for being my guest today and having a great conversation. Uh, thanks, Alyssa. <laughs> dance Med Spotlight is hosted and produced by Alyssa Arms. We discuss all things dance medicine. This has been another episode from Dance Med Spotlight. The Dance Met Spotlight is intended for educational purposes only. No clinical decision making should be based solely on one source. While care is taken to ensure accuracy, factual errors can be present.